Uh, my name is Senator Judy Seberger. I'm Senator for District 41, which is on the east side of the metro, the communities of Grant, Lake Elmo, Afton, the Lakeland Cities, Cottage Grove, Hastings, and Ninninger Township. When I'm not a senator, I work as a paramedic. I work for a few different agencies from my local fire department to a hospital health system. Um, and I uh, run calls everywhere from urban settings to rural settings to suburban and kind of everything in between. Um, so I understand the impact of EMS in our communities and I deeply understand the problems that EMS is facing today. And I'm grateful that we have a task force now assembled who can start to speak to these problems, identify what the issues are, and begin exploring what solutions might be. Um, you know, this is a, a timely issue and an important task force because the health of Minnesotans can't wait. We have a system that is on the verge of collapse and we need to start identifying solutions to these problems so that we have viable uh, EMS systems throughout the state. And when people call 911, the response that they expect is timely and uh, uh, um, adequate for their needs and uh, takes care of the problem when they need it done. So. On that note, I want to introduce uh, the next person here to speak, uh, Dr. Mike Wils Wilcox. We'll be talking a little bit about uh, rural EMS and why this task force is needed. Doctor. Thank you, Senator. And uh, let me say what a pleasure it is for me to have an opportunity to be a part of this uh, group's work uh, today. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, I am a physician, actually. I'm a family medicine uh, physician. Uh, have spent uh, my 50 years uh, in uh, uh, medicine working in a rural community on the southern part of Scott County called New Prague, New Prague, Minnesota. It's on the northern part of Lesseur County, southern part of Scott County. I started my work there as a family medicine doc in 1973. I did my initial training at North and also at Hennepin County uh, Medical Center prior to that time. And as a result of that, I had a great opportunity to get involved in emergency care work, uh, both in the rural and the metro areas. Now, as a part of that, I uh, had an opportunity then to assume the role of a medical director for rural EMS organizations. When I came to New Prague in 1973, we had a volunteer crew that was just starting to develop an ambulance service at that time, made up primarily of community leaders, uh, uh, police uh, reserve and fire uh, rescue folks. And we developed our first volunteer crew then in 1973, and I assumed the medical direction role at that time uh, because of my work at Hennepin County and at uh, North. Now, since that time, I have continued to have a unique opportunity to provide medical direction for many rural EMS organizations throughout the state. These involve emergency medical responder groups, basic life support groups, advanced life support groups, and critical care transport units. At the present time, I do medical direction for 45 of these units. I also do medical direction for six training and educational uh, organizations and programs, uh, three of which are within the MinSCU system. And during this time, we uh, train our EMS personnel to that certification of basic life support or advanced life support responders. I also, over the last 12 years, have had a unique opportunity to train and educate seasoned paramedics and seasoned EMTs to a higher level of service called the community paramedic or community EMT. These individuals can actually do house calls within their communities and provide support within their communities outside of their 911 response. I am concerned, as Senator uh, Siebel has suggested and as uh, Representative Hewitt has suggested, I am concerned about the sustainability of EMS in the rural parts of our state. It is near collapse and it needs to be uh, appropriately watched over and, and, uh, and assisted uh, to provide ongoing care uh, for the folks who need EMS services within these areas. It's a worsening issue. It has been worsening for 20 years, and when the pandemic hit us two to three years ago, it really escalated the problem. We've had significant burnout of our EMS providers, both in rural and metro areas, and uh, this has been truly problematic. In my mind's eye, there are four major factors that are facing EMS within our rural areas that need to be addressed. The first are financial struggles. EMS generates revenue by transporting patients from the scene of a medical emergency to a hospital emergency department. 
This is the only way they generate revenue. Now, in a rural area, when the number of transports is minimal, the payment for these services is minimal. And sadly, this is problematic. And in the past, volunteers in the rural area have made this up. Well, the volunteer numbers are on the decline. And that saddens me very much in the rural areas. Now, the second big factor that's facing EMS, both the rural and metro, that's causing problems, is the aging rural population. There are increasing number of folks, especially in the rural uh, populations of our state, that are exceeding the age of 65 years. Now, these individuals demand more medical care as their chronic illnesses uh, enter the picture. They tend to utilize EMS services then more uh, aggressively in these areas. And unfortunately, many of these folks may have on, may, may be uninsured or minimally insured or are covered by governmental insurance like Medicare, Medicaid, which unfortunately does not pay a lot of money for ambulance transports, especially in the rural area. The third big factor that we're facing in the rural area is a lack of new EMS providers. In the past, we have relied heavily on volunteers. Well, I can tell you those volunteers are, are no longer stepping up to the plate. It appears that the newer generation of folks who have lifestyle issues they're thinking about and so on, they're not volunteering. And what's happening is the volunteer numbers in the rural parts of our state doing EMS are on the decline. And on top of this, uh, the old timers are staying there longer than they should to perhaps shore up the uh, situation at hand. The last thing that I'm going to mention that's problematic for our folks in EMS, especially in the rural areas, is a growing demand and a longer drive time. These folks working in rural areas tend to cover large areas of their primary service region. And it takes them a long time from get to get from where they're stationed to pick up a patient and bring them back to an emergency department. This is problematic. It's taking them out of their communities for extended periods of time. This also is decreasing the volunteerism because people don't want to be leaving their communities for long periods of time. And on top of this, it also uh, leads to uh, problems of leaving the crew outside of their primary service area, and it leaves their communities vulnerable. And that truly is a problem. So in my mind's eye, these are the four major problems that EMS is facing in the rural communities right now that need to be addressed quickly uh, in order for EMS in the rural areas to survive. Thank you. So now I'll introduce uh, Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Dr. Wilcox. And thank you for coming today. Um, is we're in a real catastrophic situation. I've been a representative, I represent, I should say who I represent, I represent Rosemount, Apple Valley, and uh, Egan. And I'm blessed because it takes about five to 10 minutes for an ambulance to get to my door. My colleagues behind me, including Representative Backer, who is also an EMT, um, these are, they're in areas, and that's why we selected them for this committee, or for this select, I don't know, task force. Um, basically, their areas are in dire need. We have reports around the state of 90-minute response times. Try to hold your breath for 90 minutes. It's not going to go well. And so we need to dig into this problem and fix it. It's dire. Um, I'm a 30-year EMT. I worked my whole career. Um, I have a hearing aid to prove it. The ambulance has done me in. So um, I, I know this industry, but it has changed. And like Dr. Wilcox related, it's everything from volunteerism to long extorted ambulance rides. So what we're going to do as a group is we're going to work hard to get public input. We're going to work hard with these great people behind me because this is not a Republican, Democrat issue or not a Senate or House issue. You can see all of us are here and we're excited to dig in. But the press also, I'm hoping, has a role in this. What we really need, and I get to do the ask, we need you to step up and get those public inputs for us. We know what the industry is going to tell us, but we don't know what Joe Public or Sheila Public is going to tell us. And we really need their engagement to really tell us what EMS means to them. Is it okay if they have a 30-minute response? I'm thinking not, but I think the public has to engage us and let us know what their expectations of EMS are. A lot of people feel that EMS is nothing but the local fire department. That's not true in so many cases. EMS is volunteers like Jeff Backer that, that come out of the legislature, go to his hometown on a weekend and do runs that whole weekend, then come back. And then to help pay for the ambulance, the gas in the ambulance, Jeff is selling pancakes the next weekend. 
I'm sorry, Representative Backer. So, um, and Senator Seberg. And Senator Seberg, yeah, Senator Seberg, who also is in a metro area, but she still serves in a volunteer capacity, is selling those pancakes too. We need to fix a system that's on collapse. So with that, um, any questions that we have? Because we got to go upstairs. Just a quick one. <laughs> I mean, obviously, this is the purpose of the task force is to find solutions, but does anybody have any ideas that they're going to be bringing to the table as we enter? Yes, there are some ideas out there that um, naturally, again, as we know, the stakeholders are always going to ask for reimbursement, right? Let's get this reimbursement set up. The problem is it's not just about reimbursement. Um, if I give Jeff Back, I'm Senator, uh, Representative Backer's area, uh, per se, if we do his call volume, we would have to charge $9,800 per call up there. It's not doable, right? Um, if we do it down here, it's different because the volume, it's all based on volume on how an EMS system is, is funded. And Jeff Backer's area, if I give him $100 more a call, it really isn't going to help his area. We have a broken model, and they're gonna, many of our stakeholders will come back with reimbursement, which is a, it's that and then something else, too. So there are solutions out there, and I invite people to listen to the, the hearings that we're going to hold because those will hopefully come out. Our report is due in 25, but if something comes up that's dire, because we do have the chairs, both the, the chairs from the House and the Senate Health Committees, which this will funnel into, are sitting, uh, are part of this committee, um, we, will, we will send a bill up and through as if we see that we need to get something done, because we're really worried about this. We need our finger on the pulse. Also, I should have mentioned this, um, there's no secret here. This is also in response to two OLA audits of the regulatory arm here. We're going to be looking deeply into that to see what changes need to be made there, if any. My follow-up to that is, given the recent budget news, um, is a long-term financial situation, compensation maybe uh, feasible, uh, given what we're looking at now in 2026? <sighs> That's a good question, OK? Um, the budget isn't, you know, that budget doesn't fund, there's so many needs, right? Um, this is important, but we need the public to step forward. Is the public willing to put in the coffers a, another level of public safety per se? Is this considered public safety? So realistically, this coal group behind me want that input of their public. That's why the, the task force will be going out state. Our next meeting is in Mount Iron, Minnesota, which is that 90 minute response area that we're worried about. Then we're gonna go over to the Northwest area, then up to the upper Northwest area. So we have a number of areas, but we need to get that answer. And then I don't think anybody behind me is going to be afraid to come back to their colleagues and say, hey, here's a funding mechanism that we're, we're interested in, and we can start the debate on that as a House and Senate. In other words, you think this will be an important enough issue that it can get the support it needs? Yeah, I, I just heard Representative Backer say yes. If I may say just one thing, <laughs> with, with your question, you know, funding is important, but um, as an EMT, just like Senator Seberger, the workforce issue is a major issue. You know, um, I'm not getting any younger. I have a birthday coming on in January, and I've been serving as a volunteer for 29 years. So we're going to be looking at the workforce because when someone dials 911, they are dialing it because they have an emergency. And that's why Senator Seberger, myself, and so many of our great colleagues in this prof profession serves. We just have to, we have to make that foundation stronger. It is on a weak foundation. And I'm looking, to work, looking forward to work with my colleagues on the other side because this is not a partisan issue. When you dial 911, if it's an elderly mom, dad, or a newborn or a child, you expect professional care. Minnesota has a great tradition of providing great care. We have to look at a different model because the volunteerism is not as sustainable because we are sub volunteers like myself um, and Senator Seberger, we are subsidizing that delivery of care in greater Minnesota. So when folks from the metro area comes out and enjoy our Great Lakes, and they dial 911 if it's up in Fergus Falls or up in Clay County, they expect that. So we're going to be, we have solution which we believe with workforce and so forth. So, and I do want to a shout out for everybody out there in Minnesota who over the years who have served as a volunteer in that capacity. Um, uh, on behalf of the committee, especially Senator Seberger and myself, thank you. We appreciate that. Maybe I could make a comment too with regard to the, fund, the funding question. So. 
Representative Tina Liebling, I chair the House um, Health, Finance, and Policy Committee. So this would, I assume, be in my budget. And um, I, I'm serving ex officio on this committee, and so is Senator Wickland, who wasn't able to be here today, and she's my counterpart in the Senate. So I just wanted to say that there may be many different ways to fund the needs. And um, I, I think our goal here is to think about ways to do it and, and to put it out there. You have to start somewhere. This is not a one-year problem. This is a problem. We need to really make some big changes in the system, either in the finances or the structure of the system, or, or probably both, um, as Dr. Wilcox was talking about. So um, it's, it's not just a matter of, is there money this year? It's a matter of figuring out some long-term solutions uh, because clearly there is some money in the system. This is a critical system for Minnesota, and so it's really incumbent on us as legislators in both parties and both bodies to figure this out long-term for the good of Minnesotans who absolutely need and deserve that service wherever they live in the state. Yeah, I'm curious kind of what the timeline is for the task force and what the end goal, I, I assume it's recommendations uh, for the broader legislature, but I wondered if you could give a little more detail on that. Yeah, so if we see an urgent need, we will report right back to the, our prospective houses um, with, with a bill in hand, could be sponsored by anybody here. And so uh, the timeline, though, is our report is due uh, 25. My person's not here to talk about that right now, but... Um, we do have a report due back to the House. I think that you will see more activity, though, before that, because we, for instance, if we have a 90-minute response and it seems to be a trend, we need to deal with that as in our prospective houses right away. So hopefully that answered your question. Is there one more I thought I'd seen somebody come up with? Probably not. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. And we'll see you upstairs, hopefully.